Greetings and happy year of the tiger and welcome to today's program on foreign reporting on China from an Indian perspective. I'm Mark Frazier, co-director of the India China Institute. And it's my pleasure to introduce and welcome today's speaker, Somia Ashok. As many of you know, Somia has uh, from her, as many of you know from her and very insightful reporting on China about Indians living and working and studying in China. And you know her more recently from her reports on Taiwan, where she's studying Chinese at National Taiwan University. Somia was the Beijing correspondent for the Indian Express in 2019 and continued her reporting about China in the next year, of course, the year of the, the pandemic. Uh, and you can find many of her uh, stories in various venues, of course, the Indian Express, uh, but the South China Morning Post as well, the print, scroll.in, and many other venues, and uh, very active presence, uh, and many thousands of followers uh, that she has on Twitter also. Um, and if you've read her reporting, you know that she, uh, her stories often profile um, the everyday lives of people working, and especially Indians working and studying in China, and looking therefore um, you know, at this side of the India-China relationship, as opposed to the common journalistic preoccupation of looking at the geopolitical and the diplomatic engagements solely uh, between China and India. In today's talk, we'll hear about her reporting on the thousands of Indian students annually who go to China to pursue medical degrees at Chinese universities for reasons that she will explain during her talk. We'll also get her perspective on a topic that's talked about very much today when foreign journalists in China have faced harassment, visa denials, and several other obstacles to reporting on China. China, as many of you know, you know what winter, current Winter Olympics aside, the number of credentialed news journalists in China has reached uh, the, the lowest point in decades. Taiwan, where she's currently based, has become something of a haven for foreign journalists and writers who want to cover China, but for various reasons have faced difficulties in getting official permission to do so. Before we begin, a few housekeeping reminders. Uh, please uh, put your questions in the Q&A box and identify yourself if you'd like, and we will have ample time for your questions and Somia's answers following her presentation of about 25 minutes. Thank you very much. And I will now turn it over and ask us all to welcome Somia. Thank you so very much, Mark. I'm just going to share my screen and hope everybody can see that in just a second. Is that visible? Yes. Great. Um, Thank you so much, uh, Mark. Thank you for the wonderful and very kind introduction. And thank you for inviting me to speak as your first um, speaker of 2022. Uh, Mark and I met in Delhi at a time when there was no pandemic, <laughs> or at least a, you know, murmurs of a pandemic. Uh, it was an Institute of Chinese Studies uh, event in Delhi, an in-person conference with lots of humans in a room. So it feels like a completely different time to the one we live in. And uh, before I begin, I want to say wherever you are in the world and wherever you're watching from, thank you for making the time today. I hope you're safe, you're vaccinated, your family's safe. And I hope 2022 is better for all of us and better than the last two years of the pandemic we've lived through. I have to say I'm really glad that this talk is in English. Um, yesterday I had a horrifying three minutes uh, where I had to speak in Mandarin, justifying to my teacher why Nezai may be jiao zhong yao, which is why is inner beauty uh, better than external beauty. Um, currently I'm, I'm, I'm based in Taipei. It's uh, quite late in the night, it's about 10 p.m. Um, and I am a student at the National Taiwan University. Uh, I'm finishing my winter term here as a intermediate Chinese one level, I would say, of uh, student. Before this, I was based in, um, and I am after this also will be based in South India, in Chennai. And uh, for many years before that, I, I spent time in New Delhi uh, as a correspondent for the Hindu, for the Indian Express, and briefly for a business paper called the Mint. Now, it was the Indian Express in 2019 uh, that sent me to Beijing. 
I happened to be uh, sitting around in the office one uh, afternoon wondering what I was going to have for lunch when an editor phoned me and said, look, do you want to spend the year in Beijing? So that's really sparked my interest. Uh, I took off for a whole year. It uh, sort of set me up on a completely different path. And I can say today, three years down the line, that it has been very fruitful and I've learned so much in the process. Uh, when that call happened to me, I didn't know anything about China, very honestly. I had maybe read some stray reports here and there in the New York Times. I had a very specific perspective on uh, China that came from the West. And apart from that, China was just this huge country next door. And they spoke a different language and I had no idea what it was. Um, but for preparation's sake, I took a, a you know, taxi down to the Jawaharlal Nehru University in Delhi and uh, decided to have a chat with the East Asian uh, Studies Department there. And a professor just gave me one tip. He said, when you're in Beijing, just you know, take a high-speed trail to Tianjin. You'll find a bunch of medical students there. Uh, you should probably do a story on them. So with just that one little like uh, tip that he gave me, I took off to Beijing. And what has always served me in good stead is wherever I've been in the world, the Tamil network has come into a great help. So using my own, I'm, I, I'm a Tamil speaker, I'm Tamil, um, I ended up starting to dig through uh, a Tamil teacher who taught young Beijing uh, teenagers uh, Tamil in uh, Beijing Foreign Languages University. And through him found a medical student whose name is Manoj Sharma, who's from a uh, small town in Tamil Nadu on the coast. Now, when you hear Manoj Sharma, if you're familiar with Indian names, you'd think um, it's a North Indian name. And here was a Tamil boy in Tianjin studying medicine. And when I asked him about it, when I did meet him, turns out there was a civil servant who was posted in the district where he grew up. His parents became good friends with that civil servant who was from the North and therefore named that child after him. Um, so what I went on to do is essentially a story about the Indian medical students. And uh, this was a July 2019 piece, which I did for the Indian Express. Uh, the Indian Express had uh, and still has a fantastic uh, center spread every Sunday. It's called the big picture. It gives you a large canvas for you to tell a big story. And this was my big story uh, in July for them. Um, so this story took me to several places and I'll start off with on the ground where I went. Uh, the first stop was the Capital Medical University in Beijing. I went with my colleague uh, and uh, friend Yang, Yang Hong. She is a fantastic photojournalist. The two of us were picked up from the subway station by a young medical student who took us to the basement of his uh, international hostel and through a service elevator when we went up to his room because foreigners or visitors were not allowed into the, um, uh, to the dorms. Now, what was really interesting, and here uh, there was a whole series of don't, don't do this, don't do that. And one of that is no induction cookers, no multiple cords plugged into the extension board, no gas stoves in the room and so on and so forth. As you can see, I'm publicly uh, uh, you know, shown Akash here making chai for me in an induction cooker in his room. Um, and I think it's three years down the line and he's already back in India, so he's not gonna get expelled for this. Uh, what I learned from the boys and the, and the conversations I had with them was quite an interesting sort of mix of things. For one, they'd never seen a Burger King in their life. So they were very excited about eating burgers in Beijing. Second, these were young Tamil boys who grew up watching Bruce Lee dubbed in Tamil. So yours was a completely different sort of environment for them to come into to China. Um, what I also learned from them was uh, the way the whole network works in sending these students across the border to China. So um, here is, uh, pardon me, this is Kamlesh, his, his uh, flatmate and roommate, uh, Akash, was the one who told me that he spent or his family spent close to 3,500 US dollars as commission to an agent who actually also, apart from uh, taking money for the journey and, and making sure he gets the uh, admission, also uh, won like a ticket out of this kid uh, to get him to take her to China so she can visit a relative. Um, this is when I started getting interested. How does this whole network of agents work and where did it all start? So just to go quickly back, just for some context, China started offering uh, undergraduate English degrees in 2004. And ever since then, um, 
a combination of hearsay and sort of informal network of private agents has led to this phenomenon where every year you saw thousands of Indian medical students sort of opting for a medical degree in China. Now, the reasons for this could be uh, multiple, and one of which is this the number of seats there are back home in India. We have just as much big as China. We too have a large population in India. Uh, there are just not that many medical seats for the number of students who actually want to get into uh, college. So at the time that I did the story, which was 2019, the numbers were 84,127 seats on offer across about 573 colleges. And the second point was how cheap it was. Um, if you want to get a seat in a private medical university in India, it also comes with a certain capitation fee. So you pay a certain amount of money to actually get the seat. Now, a, a degree in China, on the other hand, uh, is considerably cheaper. So a lot more students sort of opted for um, this path if they did not get uh, to the traditional sort of uh, ways in, in India. Now, the second stop I made was the foreign students hostel in Sanjo and Herbei province. Now, this is a quick sort of high speed rail um, uh, to uh, Herbei from Beijing. Um, to this time, I was here to meet Indian medical interns at the Sanjo Central Hospital, as you can see here. And if you can imagine to the right of this building was a small sort of uh, establishment, which was the foreign students hostel. Now, life as a medical intern was interesting. I met um, three women in the room that you can see that uh, Rinalini is sitting on uh, to the right. And this is uh, Sunidhi on the left, her photograph was on the wall. And this is the corridor leading up to their rooms, which was a combination of utensils, clothes, books, a uh, whole bunch of things have been going on here. I even sort of bumped into a couple they had met in the hostel, both Indian from different states, very worried about how they're going to keep their relationship going uh, once they go back to India because they came from different castes and uh, their parents were not going to approve of their match. Now here, Rinalini was studying for her final exams, uh, which were coming up, as well as studying for the uh, licensing exam she has to take when she goes back to India, which, is, uh, which I'll talk about in a bit. On the left, uh, the picture that I've sh shown is that of Sunidhi. Sunidhi comes from the northern state of uh, Punjab. Uh, she told me that uh, when she finished her high school final exam, so what we call class 12 exams in India, board exams, she got, her father started getting a series of phone calls from agents uh, telling him, why don't you send your child to Ukraine or Russia or China to study medicine? Now, she suspected at the time that the phone number was circulated from the forms she filled up to actually get admission into medical tests in India, medical entrance exams. The reason she came to China was simply, I did not have another choice, she told me. Um, I only got a dentistry seat and I did not want to do dentistry. The person I mentioned before, Manoj Sharma, I know him as Joy. I'm not sure if he's listening today and if he is, hello Joy. Uh, extremely helpful young man, uh, showed me the big uh, wonderful lion uh, in Sanjo. He showed me uh, all of Sanjo's sites that afternoon. We went for a big walk. And what I really loved about Manoj's story is that he was there to study medicine, but he was also there in China and fully present in, in China. He integrated wonderfully. He's, he played badminton with a bunch of uh, Chinese uh, folks in Sanjo. He walked across after his shift every day to the big park just across from the hospital and used to hang out with all the senior citizens uh, who were practicing uh, martial arts because I believe Sanjo is historically known for wushu or martial arts. So he soon became their Induran student and they would be showing him around saying, this is my Indian student and everyone would boast about uh, how great Manoj's skills sort of were in that time. My third stop for the story was graduation day in Tianjin Medical University. So I've given you a snapshot of a fourth year students in a medical uh, college or university in Beijing, an internship year, which is their final year before they go off back home. And here's graduation day when they've made it till the end after the sixth year. Now throughout this time, by the way, apart from medicine, they study Mandarin. So all of them are pretty proficient in uh, speaking Chinese. Now, these are some of uh, wonderful shots uh, by my colleague who came with me. Uh, what I figured out here very quickly is it's not just an Indian story, it was a subcontinent story. Here were students from Sri Lanka, Nepal, Bangladesh, Pakistan, uh, uh, everywhere, entire subcontinent. And so you could see the signs of this in uh, wonderfully in, in the local Tianjin markets. 
Uh, but just before I, I tell you that, um, one of the most striking sort of stories I found there, which I mentioned very briefly in the Indian Express story that I wrote, was that of Vega Singh. Now, Vegas is not just a medical student, as you can see. Um, he's a bodybuilder. He's a basketball player. And um, his story just was completely exceptional because he shows up as a young, scrawny uh, kid from India to do his undergrad graduation in Tianjin. He told me at the time, uh, people used to stare at me because I was wearing something on my head in reference to his turban. He used to be on the subway where people would uh, laugh and point and take pictures of him. And he felt extremely crushed by this kind of attention and started hitting the gym. And as you can see, six years later, this is how he looks uh, with a massive presence on Douyin, which is uh, Chinese TikTok. Uh, what we know as TikTok elsewhere is known as Douyin in China. Now, um, what, through, I think, 2018, uh, he told me that his muscular body and his obedient cat, Marvel, which is pictured in, uh, in the smaller sort of photo that I put up, they went viral. And so he started to capitalize on that. And he actually uh, was then contacted, since he'd become such a big influencer, he'd been contacted by a bunch of sports companies to uh, advertise their uh, products. Now, just to go back to what I mentioned before, these signs of this ecosystem that have started to develop around the engine. So you go to the local market and you start to see Haldiram packets, which is if you know uh, Indian food, uh, it's a famous snack. Uh, if you're in New York uh, and have access to the subway, uh, take a train to the Queens, uh, you'll find the Patel store and you'll find lots of Indian food there, including Haldiram packets. So what I saw was amul ghee, uh, which we love cooking with, rasagullas, gulab jamun, haldiram, all sort of jostling with uh, packets and packets of, of, of uh, noodles and, and bok chai and a whole bunch of uh, items that you use for Chinese cooking. One of the students I met and he, he spoke to, he said very clearly to me, you know, how much noodles can one eat? <laughs> so here was this uh, Chinese man who set up his own restaurant, Hassan restaurant, uh, it's named after him. As you can see, he, he has a pet parrot on his shoulder, which is how he rolls uh, every day. Um, and these are some of the um, prices that uh, was advertised in his store. I have to say, I tried getting into the restaurant multiple times on my visit. Uh, it was absolutely packed and the biryani had run out, so I had no luck, which was very sad. Now, ideally at this stage of the presentation or the way I have talked about my work in this particular field before, I would take you straight from uh, graduation day back to India uh, to sort of prepare for the FMGE or the licensing exams back home. But what I was actually at the end of in 2019 was a very peculiar year because what we went into was a pandemic year. So I'm gonna just ask you to bear with me for about five minutes while I just take you through this journey which happened as well, given uh, what a what a absolutely crazy sort of time we all went into as uh, as as the world. So here were early days of the pandemic. Uh, this was me back in Noida, back in my office in Indian Express, which is on the outskirts of Delhi, trying to report back on what uh, is happening in China. So the the big question I had was, hey, hold on, Wuhan has a massive uh, medical university. Lots of Indian students lived there. I'd spoken to some of them for my story. What happened to all of them? How are they coping? Now, one batch had actually already sort of left uh, very cleverly before the lockdown was imposed. They had just taken it upon themselves to book their own tickets, uh, figure out a way. I think some of them took a train to Chengdu, uh, Kunming, and so on. And sorry, not uh, Chengdu, Kunming, uh, in Yunnan and flew to Calcutta in East India and then went back to different parts of the country. So if you actually trace back to the early days of the pandemic in India, what we can actually notice is um, it was actually one of those early sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, journeys back home that brought the virus uh, to India through uh, one of the medical students coming back. Um, I'll just give you a quick sort of, uh, so these were some of the stories I did in that time tracking those early days, how quiet it was uh, from the eyes of Indians, how did they manage what they were doing, um, and then sort of a back and forth between Chinese authorities, Indian authorities, the Beijing uh, Indian mission, 
uh, sort of arranging uh, an Air India flight to go to Wuhan with medical supplies and in return bringing back like hundreds of students. So these were some of the early sort of stories we did. As you can see the dates, uh, I'm sorry if it isn't uh, very visible, but it was January and February of 2020. I think one of the students sent me, and I hope you were able to see this, um, a very, very short video from them departing from Wuhan. Um, I was in touch with them constantly. Some of them video called me. It was a panic, a panic filled few weeks, but uh, the Indian mission pulled it off uh, fantastically. They organized it and brought a lot of these students back home. Now, uh, Wuhan has students and Wuhan has Indian professionals. So the students uh, basically uh, all almost came back and the professionals, many of them decided to stay back because things were still unclear at that point, as we all know, and we think back to those early days. So just a quick video to see, I hope you're able to see this. Now the, the language you can actually hear is Malayalam. So there's uh, people coming back to the Southern state of Kerala in this video. And this second video, uh, just for laughs, uh, a lot of people laughed at this video. Uh, it went viral uh, immediately after a whole batch of medical students from across different parts of China were brought back to India, to North India. They were put up in Manesar, uh, which is just on the outskirts of Delhi. It's kind of like an army sort of camp there. And this was a first batch of like our version of um, quarantine, uh, just to make sure that they are uh, fine. I wanted to show you this. Uh, also, just to give you a sense of how the quarantine facilities looked uh, in those early days. Um, just for some light moment, uh, also to say that, also to say that um, I spent two weeks in uh, quarantine in um, in. Taiwan as I was coming in to, uh, uh, for, to study here. And I completely understand the urge to want to dance and go a little crazy with Indian music at the end of that journey. Um, now, this was a piece we did in early February. Uh, this was with my colleague uh, in Kerala, where I said many of these students uh, came back to in those initial days. Once again, this was a big picture story. We did a Sunday spread to try and understand um, how Kerala was coping with these early cases of students coming in, how were they put under quarantine, what was the method in place. And Kerala is actually one of the most pioneering states. Uh, if you've been following the news keenly on India, you'll know for sure that uh, from a very early uh, stage, they had things under control and they had real uh, amazing sort of uh, uh, protocols in place, uh, largely from their own uh, you know, background in managing other kinds of viruses before, including Nipah virus. Now, um, this is just to give you a juxtaposition on how uh, we covered the story. The, the uh, paragraph above is by my colleague in Kerala. He was tracking the, um, you know, life of a 22 year old medical student who came back, uh, was sort of put in quarantine. Mother would come in to give him, sorry, uh, leave food for him outside while he played on his smartphone uh, for the rest of the day and still keeping in touch with his uh, friends uh, here and there in, in, in India. Now, the second part is me trying to dig a little deeper from where I was in Delhi at the time. Through my Chinese friends, I got in touch with someone uh, who was living in uh, Hubei at that time, not in Wuhan, but in one of the smaller sort of uh, villages adjacent to the big city. Uh, uh, this is a student. She had gone back to uh, get gone back home like everybody else had gone back home during Chinese New Year and then got stuck. So we had long conversations on WeChat uh, during those early months. And this is what she told me. Very interesting sort of, uh, uh, you know, um, sort of DIY slogans that were going on and uh, the kind of um, the kind of sort of restrictions they had in those times. So. Uh, just to give you a second to sort of read uh, these, uh, just to sort of get a sense of what was going on. Now, back to where I, I left you before, uh, how does the journey back home, say it's a normal year and there was no pandemic, uh, what would have ideally happened is you come back to writing the licensing exam. So if you're an Indian medical student who studied abroad, uh, it's specifically in some parts of uh, Eastern Europe or Central um, Asia or China, you have to take what is called the foreign medical graduate exam. Now, 
in the year that I lived in Beijing, um, there was a study that was done by the Indian government where they uh, actually figured out how much of a pass percentage there was for this test. And less than 12% of Indian students who obtained a Chinese medical degree between 2015 and 18 actually cleared this exam. Now, this is a mandatory licensing exam. It is uh, by the Medical Council of India. It's held usually every June. It has 300 uh, marks and uh, essentially you've got to get 50% to pass it. And uh, the last statistic on the slide is of the 14,702 Indian students across 42 of the 45 approved Chinese medical universities, only 1,790 cleared the exam uh, in that time period. Now, uh, what's important, which I didn't mention before, and I apologize for that, uh, when, when we talk about 42 of the 45 approved, uh, what had happened through this sort of uh, hodgepodge of getting, you know, through hearsay and private agents getting involved in what is essentially a market uh, that had started to develop for medical education, um, a lot of rampant sort of uh, proliferation of um, uh, substandard medical universities had started to pop up in different parts of China. So to make sure that Indian students knew which ones were the approved ones, there was actually a list that would come out every year so that the Indian students are um, you know, able to discern for themselves uh, which ones they should actually apply for. Now, uh, I kept with the story through 2020. By this stage, I had left the Indian Express. I'd moved back to Chennai. Uh, and I thought uh, this was a good time. I mean, everyone got very caught up with our lives and uh, I was going into a, a very long um, lockdown in Chennai for almost like three months or four months as we all did in India. And in that time, uh, shifted focus a lot to COVID reporting in uh, more domestically. But I tried to keep up with uh, the larger sort of contours of what was happening in the India-China space because in June of that year, what we uh, had was uh, one of the most deadliest of sort of uh, clashes at the border, which really plummeted the way the two countries started to notice each other from that point. Uh, subsequently, uh, uh, you know, tens of apps got uh, banned, which included WeChat, which included TikTok. And all of this had a big effect on the Indian medical students who had come home. Now, in September of that year, I pitched a story to the South China Morning Post because a lot of these students I'd been in touch with had come back to India and they started uh, you know, contacting me and saying, is there something you can do? You know, we are actually qualified. We've just not finished. Uh, we've just not gone back for graduation or we've just have like a semester or a few weeks left. Why can't the Indian government um, use us uh, especially at a time when uh, you know, we have this sort of public health crisis on our hands. So what they told me was this large population of people that could not uh, practice medicine, especially when at that point of writing the story, I think our case count had crossed something like four, 4.5 million. And the whole military tensions at the time, the border tensions um, had sort of complicated the situation. There was ran, rampant sort of anti-China prejudices uh, at play in India. Uh, if you're if you a keen follower of the space, once again, you'd have noticed these, these sort of videos of people uh, throwing their uh, Chinese smart TVs from the first floor and jumping on it and making a show of having to break uh, things that uh, were Chinese. Now, in all of this um, were a bunch of these students who got caught in this mess. Many of them while walking down the road, if your neighbors and uh, others know that you're from, uh, you know, a student who has studied in China, many of them would be heckled, even called China Kamal, which is a Chinese product. Um, now, what is one, when I was doing the story, one of the academics I spoke to, um, and I hold in high regard, uh, Dr. Rama Baru was also telling me, now, what is the need to have such a incredibly hard exam for these students, right? And specifically that year, it, they went into incredibly long like protests across the country. Nearly everywhere you could see students come out and sit down and protest holding up these placards. And um, they said to me uh, constantly, we found that this year the exam was exceptionally hard. 2020 was extremely hard. They couldn't understand why many of them walked out of the exam feeling completely crushed. Um, now, uh, the border tensions definitely sort of added to, to this space and uh, they 
did not know what else to do. They had to keep trying to write the exam over and over again. Now, a year later, I kept with it, November 2021. I went back and revisited some of those stories uh, and again figured out uh, this isn't just an India problem, it's a South Asian problem. So I spoke to some students in Bangladesh, I spoke to some students in Sri Lanka, and the larger sort of uh, constant uh, repetition was, uh, you know, there are border restrictions still in place. We have no idea when we're going to go back. We've just been sitting at home doing absolutely nothing. Um, there's no communication from the universities. Uh, we are still no communication on going back, but very much in terms of medical education. Most of the medical education took place through videos that were sent to the students. It wasn't live classes by any of the teachers. They had to just uh, play the video and clock in to make sure that the video is entirely seen, right? So you can literally play the video and walk off from, my computer as, uh, from the computer as long as you can show that you've seen it fully. Uh, one of the students told me that one of the only things that they have a live sort of class on is Mandarin classes, which are on a live Zoom, uh, but not any of the actual medical classes. Now with this, I will end the part of the Indian medical student. Uh, of course, I did multiple other stories in this time, uh, which had the India-China sort of connect, right? So I, I spoke to Mandarin speaking tour guides in this time who or were in the Buddhist belt or the North Indian belt, uh, who would largely sort of, uh, you know, every year have amazing numbers of Chinese tourists coming in who they would then show around these places. I uh, spoke to uh, Indian influencers who were affected by the TikTok ban. So I did some stories for Technode in Beijing at the time. Um, later, I also spoke to some Fabing makers. So an entire village in uh, Tamil Nadu. Uh, sent out men to China who worked in different parts and different hotels um, who would make this like Jian Bing sort of thing, which is the Fei Bing, which is I think the flying sort of uh, Bings, which is kind of like our fluffy parata in, in, in um, India. And uh, there were so many stories. I think what my time in China sort of made me realize is when I do transport myself back to India and I start to notice there are actually so many ways in which the two countries were connected. Uh, Again, through the second wave of the uh, virus, we had uh, oxygen on Taobao. There were Indians in China buying oxygen, sort of, uh, um, I think I'm not able to recollect the exact name, but like being able to send those uh, compressors back to India uh, to their family or donate it uh, to different causes. Um, but I have, to, I have to say that I did also tell stories from entirely the perspective of Chinese people. And um, I think this is important. It is important to cover uh, as a foreign reporter connections of the two countries as much as it's important to tell stories of the people who live in those countries. And I'll tell you why perspective matters. I think it's important as an Indian or from anywhere we come is each of us have views on who we are and how we want people to see us. And those identities are uh, not those that are given to us, but those that we feel for ourselves. And often what we do, unfortunately, in these larger, broader strokes, we end up conflating the government and the people who live in those countries. And I think we do that with China, we do that with India, we do that with any context when we don't know it very well. Um, so what I try to do is, uh, let me go in search of, of Chinese people Okay, maybe they only spoke English and it's a bit of a disadvantage given I didn't speak Mandarin at the time. But even if I restrict myself to English speaking um, Chinese people, what are the kinds of stories uh, I can find? Now on the far right is um, uh, Kao Aijia, who I met uh, in Beijing. He's a podcaster. I did a story on him for the Indian Express. And he had a fantastic uh, podcast called Gushu FM. Gushu is story in Mandarin. And he had a series of stories with entirely in Mandarin, and I hope I can revisit them and maybe understand a word here or there now after about two years of Mandarin study. But he did this incredible sort of series of stories where he interviewed an, um, sort of a journalist who was undercover in Shenzhen, spending time with young men. They were, they were called San He Dashen. This was sort of a self-mocking name given to debt-ridden, internet-addicted young people who were sick of working in factories and started working as daily wagers and would sort of play around with their phones and so on. So he was telling me these like 
how he sources these stories from across um, the country. Uh, the person in the middle is a person from uh, Fujo who, uh, back in the day, uh, this was a story based, I think, around uh, the 40s. And what he did uh, throughout his life is um, he took a selfie, well, the older version of a selfie. He walked to a photo studio every year on the same date. I think it was his birthday. And he would pose and take a picture. And whatever the picture was, was a reflection of the politics of the time or how his mood was or what the situation was. So uh, how I came to know about this story was actually an art collector and a photographer in Beijing who had come upon this, uh, this, these photos and, and has written a book about it. So it was through the eyes of him uh, telling the story of this man who took what we could consider to be an old school selfie. To the left is uh, Sam. Uh, Sam runs a platform called Yummy. Uh, it's an excellent uh, platform for women uh, to go online anonymously and talk about sexuality and ask as many questions as they want. Now, I met Sam again in Beijing, and it was wonderful to hear her speak about her project and her own sort of vision for, uh, as a lesbian woman, her own vision for how she'd like uh, for the community to sort of grow and be comfortable in China. Um, Having said that, I got in touch with Sam almost as early as when I moved to Beijing because I read about her uh, somewhere. And I remember I didn't actually sit down to her to speak with her till like much later. In between me contacting her and finally the interview being granted to me, the New York Times did a piece about her. Um, it became, it was a great story. Uh, it was therefore her platform was uh, censored briefly um, by Chinese authorities and then when I contacted her, she said, you know, let's give me some time, I'll get back to you. Uh, I finally managed to sit down with her um, for these stories, for this story. Um, so the reason I call these soft stories is how the larger journalistic community will sometimes term these. And I find that to be um, quite difficult to deal with. Uh, I feel a version of what good journalism is or strong and like uh, powerful journalism is uh, always supposed to be strategic affairs or geopolitics or, or for that matter, uh, any kind of like, you know, hard hitting stuff. But at the end of the day, I think what we all should also understand is who are these people and how do they live? And I think when I, when I walked into the space in Beijing, I had such a short period of time. There were also other Indian uh, journalists uh, they're based already, who were writing stories about geopolitics and, and other things. So I said, if I was going to carve out for myself this sort of niche, what would that be and what can I do quickly? When I frankly do not cover uh, Chinese politics, uh, I didn't, my language skills are definitely not even uh, remotely sort of, um, uh, remotely, uh, you know, excuse me, sorry. Uh, my my um, language skills are not remotely uh, sort of, Hi, I mean, it wasn't great at the time. And so I thought, let me let me focus on stories that I can tell well. And these were some of the stories. So the selfie in Fujo is the one that I mentioned of the man. Uh, the 996 debate was interesting one, uh, which involved Jack Ma. Uh, there were two, uh, there, were, uh, there was a couple I met in Shanghai who had actually written the code uh, which they shared uh, publicly on uh, GitHub where if you adopt that uh, code as, a, as an organization, you're signaling that you care for uh, good labor uh, sort of practices. Um, and this sort of came out of programmers, uh, software engineers and programmers in the IT industry. The reason I did this and it resonated well with an Indian audience is because we have similar problems in India as well of overwork, of, of not, being, uh, not having a fulfilled life and, and how, how much overtime we are made to do without actually being compensated for it. As I mentioned the podcast, I also did a story on the trash cans and facial IDs. It was an experiment in a small Beijing neighborhood where you can walk uh, towards the trash can and it'll actually pop up, uh, pop open. It was kind of weird. My last story from Beijing was uh, one about eyes in um, the Indian diplomatic circle. So you had these Chinese eyes, these, these wonderful uh, women, Chinese women, who often would come from Anhui province. They had historically came from that one province. That's what I found out as well. And they would then sort of uh, be the person who cares for your children, who cooks for you, who cleans your house, who sort of the person who looks after your home for you. 
um, through the wonderful Indian mission uh, in Beijing, where I knew a lot of young uh, foreign officers there, a lot of them put me in touch with their eyes. And I did a piece about the diplomatic eyes. I'm calling it that. That was not actually the name. I think the name that Express gave it was Spice Root, because they'd learned to cook Indian food and had taken meticulous notes. And many of them showed me their news, uh, you know, their notebooks filled with recipes um, to sort of say, how did, how was it done? And one of them told me Indian cooking just requires a lot of patience. And those early days, I used to take notes and go home and revise and look up uh, videos online to get it right. When I went to meet one of them, she was making the most excellent aloo parathas, which is, um, well, a paratha stuffed with uh, potato in it. And, um, I'm actually thinking I'm, I'm hungry now because of that thought. And um, uh, it was just a wonderful example of, of, uh, of, of these two sort of completely different, but in a way, Asian sort of cultures coming together. One of them also told me that uh, she cared for a diplomat's uh, kids. And when they were leaving and transferred back to India, the kids were really upset and asked her to come back with them. But uh, she could not because uh, she has her own ch children and her own life in, in China. Now I'll leave you with just uh, like sort of some final thoughts on what I think and how Indian foreign reporting sort of works in, I think I've made, uh, sorry, oops. <laughs> Indian foreign reporting sort of uh, fits into all of this. And um, one of the things I did quickly uh, in preparation for this talk was uh, sort of write to a senior reporter, a senior journalist in the Hindu, a national newspaper back in India, uh, who, um, know, who, who covers international relations and foreign affairs. And I asked him, you know, roughly if you have to tell me how many uh, foreign reporters currently there are from India sent abroad, what would that count be? And I think between us sort of, we came to a conclusion that there was probably about eight or nine folks across the world uh, many of them concentrated in, um, in Washington, D.C., and uh, the next big batch in China, uh, Beijing and Hong Kong, and uh, one person in Colombo. Now, of these eight, uh, and I think there was a woman also in uh, Afghanistan, but she has returned. Um, of these eight or nine, uh, it's almost the majority is male, uh, sort of uh, male journalists in all of these places. Now, every time I go abroad and live in a different place and get to know foreign reporters, it's a very different and very interesting perspective. Um, there's no comparison when you look at when we look at Indian foreign reporting. There's there's absolutely like no comparison with the American foreign reporting style. Um, everything is different from from funds, from the dedication and time that editors want you to spend time in these places to learn. So every time I meet American journalists, I'm all, always uh, slightly envious of the opportunities they get to live for long periods in these places, to report from these places. Um, frankly, I think uh, foreign reporting is perhaps not priority for Indian media organizations. So for a person like me who is trying to fit into this sort of larger uh, canvas, it's hard to get an opportunity that will say, someone will back you to send you to these places. Now, the problem with the way that we think then of how we look at the um, rest of the world is we are running after the everyday uh, daily sort of, uh, you know, run of the mill stories and some, so to speak, because there are problems that we need to cover. There are stories we need to cover on a, on a regular daily uh, basis, which could be border tensions or which could be some great announcement from the government. But unfortunately, that restricts us to a certain way of looking at a country, whether that is a north-south sort of way, whether there's a male-female uh, way, whether there's a west-east way. So there are all these perspectives that need to be taken into consideration. And one of that, um, I think, is most important is to just have boots, more boots on the ground, which is really, really, really important. Otherwise, what we end up having is a whole bunch of uh, people who... Uh, you know, can sort of say that they know without actually having gone to these places. And um, I, I've, I wonder whether I'll have the opportunity to, to um, return to China, given the state of how things are. And as Mark sort of pointed out at the beginning of the talk, um, is, it, is it really going to change going forward? 
Is the pandemic one way uh, to keep more foreigners out of China? Will we actually see a change in, in having uh, you know, more foreigners, foreign reporters going back uh, to understand the country better? Um, now, I, I think uh, I'd be happy to like take more questions. Uh, I, I'll stop there for now. Um, thank you very much. Here's a quick story that I did from Taiwan of, um, of grandparents who uh, were asked by their uh, young grandson back in 2020 when the pandemic hit them in their laundry store to model in abandoned clothes left behind and they became an internet sort of sensation in Taiwan. Uh, the story has just come out over the weekend in scroll so you're welcome to have a look. And I love how every post that they had at the time was a friendly reminder, don't forget to pick up your laundry. I'll stop with that and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Samia. That was such a rich uh, presentation, so many details um, of the sort that, you know, for a social science researcher like myself and colleagues, you know, we would just be, uh, you know, so uh, delighted if we were able to have that kind of access in our in our scholarship. But I think it's an interesting uh, kind of point you make the distinction between so-called soft stories versus the so-called hard news, and uh, it you know that sort of division I think is also reflected in in a lot of of research on China and elsewhere, which is that you know one works in social sciences and does, you know, measurements of concepts and variables and using statistical packages to try to explain things or looks at, you know, international relations and diplomatic dialogues and this kind of thing. But, you know, so much can be learned, as, as you point out, from the, um, the, the so-called uh, story, the so-called soft stories, but they're really story stories. They're not soft or hard or anything else. And the connections um, that, uh, human connections that form through these flows uh, of through you know whether it's medical sector or or the IT sector or uh, you know long histories of, of mercantile networks that that have existed across the two spaces, um, but I guess if I can begin with with one question and we're getting several coming into the chat which is great into the Q and A, um, you know you mentioned about the kind of the future of reporting uh, on China and you know given the current restriction and given the likelihood of continued restrictions. Um, you know, is the kind of story that you're that you've done so well uh, possible to do over, you know, Zoom or WeChat or various platforms where you're not physically present, but you can nonetheless still, um, you know, are people willing? Would people be will be willing to talk to you uh, from China uh, if you were, say, sitting in in Taiwan, where, you know, you could you, you could. Uh, could work, but not have to be physically, uh, technically, officially licensed to, you know, do uh, be a journalist in the PRC. Um, I think yes, to an extent, maybe mm -hmm. uh, not to the kind of detail that I would have got. Uh, say, if I had done the medical student story sitting from Delhi, I just would not have seen, uh, say, the Haldiram packets in the Tianjin um, market, right? So just to get the nuts and bolts of it, uh, and I, I will say, I boast to say that I'm a good descriptor. If you put me in a spot, I really describe things well because I want you to see what I'm seeing. That's really how I write. But I, I, I worry that I will not be able to do that if I don't have access to uh, a country or a place that I'm, I'm looking at. Having said that, isn't that what we are trying to do now? A whole bunch of foreign reporters are sitting in Taiwan trying to cover mainland mm -hmm. uh, China or China. Um, so, uh, and I think it's possible to do that, uh, but as an Indian uh, with, with the current restrictions that we have between the two countries and the fact that WeChat has been banned, that has sort of uh, set me back a bit because unlike my favorite uh, journalist on China, Peter Hessler, who has had wonderful number of years in China, I've only had the one year and a lot of my friends are on WeChat and I have sort of lost touch with them. And uh, it's, it's, it is a problem uh, on how do you reconnect when you, your old mode of trans, uh, sorry, communication sort of just goes dead, right? And um, so it is, I think we're operating in very different times to when um, the first set of like foreign reporters went out and tried to cover the world. It's got all gotten much uh, harder. Having said that, we have technology as well, which is also making things easier. So perhaps we'll try and find some sort of middle ground to do a decent report on 
what we're looking for. Right, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm just quickly glancing at the, the Q&A uh, list. And um, and by the way, for, for you and the audience, uh, if, if you can, we will go a little bit past the, the top of the hour here at 10 yes. o'clock. I'm so um, sorry that I spoke too much. No, it's, it's fine. I, I just wanted to let people know that they needn't uh, you know, leave the room uh, in nine minutes. So we'll, we'll, we'll carry on a little bit past the, the scheduled ending. Um, so one question comes from uh, uh, Robert Walker, who is a, a sociologist based in, at Beijing Normal University uh, and teaches sociology and public policy. But the question, I, I, I guess, uh, which came up in your talk is, um, you know, is medical training in China inferior to that of, of other disciplines? But I think I'd add to that, um, what, what are these medical universities that are attracting uh, foreign students, uh, South Asian and, and elsewhere, what are they up to? Are they trying to um, you know, carve out a niche for themselves uh, because they're not able to uh, attract um, you know, domestic mainland students? Or are they, you know, what, what, are, is there a financial incentive? Um, what, what's, what's going on? And is the education, you know, is the quality of medical training um, you know, at these places uh, below that of, of, you know, counterpart medical institutions uh, of the more, you know, big name type in China. Right. Um, actually, I mean, that's something I missed out uh, mentioning. Uh, what, what we have to understand is these students actually uh, function in a bubble. Uh, they work, they sort of mm -hmm. study in an international bubble. So many of these universities actually have a parallel track for Chinese speaking Chinese students. So mm -hmm. they never actually interact with the domestic students. So you have an international bunch coming in studying in English, and then you have the Chinese students studying in Mandarin. Um, Wuhan Medical University is a, one of the top universities and you have both Chinese students and uh, foreigners. What I think has happened is the market has just responded to uh, a demand problem here, right? Like you've got, uh, you, you see that there is a potential for making more money and therefore you, open up for let's let's start English language. And the first batch was only about 150 Indian students in the first uh, few years, they were very small numbers. Uh, but also there were, uh, when if you trace back in time, there was actually diplomatic sort of uh, conversations between India and China to facilitate this kind of exchange. It just also didn't happen just uh, out of a market sort of problem. Um, so uh, it was in response to, if there is an option, could we also study here? And I think Russia, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, China have all sort of been, Georgia, have all sort of been uh, big destinations for medical students. Um, so I wouldn't call it inferior. Having said that, I do think that at least in the initial years, uh, when you're not familiar with the context, um, I think I remember a lot of the students telling me some of their subjects were explained really well and some weren't, uh, but I think, uh, uh, that pretty much could be in any context as well. Um, mm -hmm. But um, the way I look at it is they were having a Indian experience in these kinds of university campuses, but set to a sort of Chinese background score, right? Like you, ha you lived in this environment, but you were listening to Mandarin, but you were sort of operating in these bubbles. So uh, that is why the reform came into place to identify which universities Indian students should go and study at. So as I mentioned, uh, every year there's a list that comes out in April, which the Chinese sort of Ministry of Education puts out, which then the Beijing Embassy also puts on, Indian Embassy puts on its uh, um, homepage to say, look, if you're interested in applying for medical education, these are the approved universities. And many of them are top ranking universities, so not inferior in that sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So what I'm going to do, we, we have about, and thanks to the audience for, for uh, we've got 16 and now 17 questions. I and I've, <laughs> I quickly glanced through and I'm going to group them into kind of two broad categories. Um, and and, the, and the, so the first category would be some follow up questions about the, the lives of the students. Um, and so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll throw out four uh, brief points uh, from these questions. Uh, so one is, um, you know, what about uh, the gender perspectives on the students? Um, you know, is there a gender dimension to this? Uh, and maybe uh, you could also remind us again of the approximate number uh, of, of Indian students who were at these universities between 2015 and 2018. 
and maybe the the gender composition in, in, as a matter of fact and then you know post pandemic um, you know what, what have the numbers uh, looked like? I assume they've declined precipitously, uh, which leads to a, a second sub question, which is what is the future of, of this, this, these flows of, of Indian uh, students um, going to medical institutions for education in China? What does the future look like? And then uh, finally, on this category, um, you know, are there, were there uh, support groups of faculty or students, Chinese faculty, Chinese students, who were, uh, you know, kind of organized to support and help the uh, the students who were stuck there, uh, the Indian or maybe foreign students who were stuck at these universities when the pandemic first hit. Okay, so those, those okay. any any anything you want to uh, respond in those kind of four areas of the first category? Sure. Uh, with the overall numbers, I'm going to struggle to give a straight answer because we actually don't know. Yeah. We have vague numbers. And if you look at my story, I think at the time, uh, it was about nearly 20,000 students in China at the time, 2019. Um, there is no official count. So what happens mm -hmm. is, uh, there's because there's a combination of, uh, you know, approved universities plus some of these fly-by-night universities, uh, many of the students are also like coming in without anyone really knowing where they're going. Now, the Indian Embassy does a really good job uh, appealing to these students to actually register with them. So uh, technically, when you come into China, they say, look, we are here for you. Uh, send us your details so we know okay. you know where you are. Uh, but they don't really have a count either, like a, a, like a final count as such. So I'm gonna definitely struggle with that question. And also the gender perspective, I would think there were much more men. Um, also, it was China, the language was difficult. Um, mm. And um, being far away from home and not really having a context to what China is, right? Uh, so there were a lot of people worried to send their uh, kids there. Having said that, the women I did speak to were extremely comfortable in China because they said it is so safe. We could go out late in the night and come back and nothing Mm -hmm. onto what happens. It's very unlike home. So that was quite an interesting thing. The future of these flows is interesting. I spoke to some agents uh, just before moving to Taiwan. I did the second story on the follow-up and I was like, look, are uh, things opening up? You know, on the overall, uh, China's not giving any indication. Chinese universities are not giving any indications to these students. And one agent very confidently, like I could see his WhatsApp status message said, applications are open, like get in touch for China, Ukraine, Russia, mm. like, you know, he's already selling the next batch. Now, when you call him and I said, you know, do you think it's actually going to happen? He said, of course, like, you know, the confident, of course, it'll happen. Just, you know, like put in your application and we'll, we'll have a look. I do know there were flows of students already starting to go to other markets because China was closed. So there were students going to Russia, mm -hmm. there was students going to Kazakhstan. In Russia, one of the agents told me, uh, since they shared a bathroom, uh, a lot of them, there was a bit of a cluster situation that happened. And so now there's pushback on, till you know for sure that there are separate bathrooms and separate ways of being, uh, don't push us to go uh, to these places. So there's all these internal dynamics happening, which uh, I actually wanna do a completely separate story on what happened to all the private agents in the last two years, right? Like right. their business dry up. So that's a story I'll do when I go back home. Um, as for the support groups, one interesting point is Indian medical students don't come under the Department of Medicine. They come under the Department of International Students and International Relations. Uh, so mm -hmm. there is a difference in the way they deal with them. And when it comes to support groups, I did hear a lot of them tell me about uh, Chinese professors or teachers or laoshers who like looked out for them. Uh, a lot of them speak very fondly about their Chinese teachers. Uh, I do think that was a big, um, big sort of hole in my story because I didn't have Chinese voices. Even if I did contact them, they didn't want to speak to me. Um, mm. I was too new to the context. I was not able to convince anyone that um, you know, they should trust me. And I think that's always a problem. Uh, maybe today I'd be able to speak to them in Chinese a little for them to gain, uh, for them to like uh, tell me their stories. But um, I do know f at that point, uh, during the evacuation time, there was a lot of support. Um, there was also uh, like some of them, it was a very hard period. Nobody knew what was going on in those early pandemic days. So, uh, but from what I know, they were fed, they were well fed and made to sit on campus till they got a plane home. Okay, thanks. Um, 
yeah, it's, it's interesting. The agents are pushing Ukraine and Russia, but uh, for obvious reasons, that may be uh, they may need to find another another yes. area for medical education. Um, uh, okay, so the 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 last grouping of questions um, has to do with uh, your profession, and I think these are these sort of fall under uh, professional advice for you know people who are entering journalism. Uh, one is. Um, you know, how do you spot a story? How do you, when, as you're observing the world around you, how do you uh, come up with a, a story that you can pitch to one of your editors? Um, and as, you know, we can focus that on the, in terms of when you were in China, let's say. Um, and related to that, uh, did you ever encounter uh, situations where you felt intimidated or, or even worse as you were doing your, your professional job of reporting on China? Um, how do you, uh, third question is, um, the, the, the questioner asks, uh, turns these micro stories or, you know, we, we used soft stories before, but these are sort of the, you know, close level details of, of personal, uh, of, of per individuals and their, their comings and goings. How does one fact check, um, you know, to the extent possible, um, you know, I guess if someone says, they're, you know, that they, they passed the exam or failed the exam. How do you sort of fact check some of the, these details? And then the fourth question is, um, do you have uh, just general tips uh, for professional tips, career tips for uh, emerging writers and reporters who okay. are wanting to follow in your footsteps? Sure. Um, how do I spot a story? Um, and if it was in the context of China, to be very honest, everything was a story in China for me, yes. every single thing, right? Because we know so, so little about China in India that I was walk, I'll walk down the road and see five things and be like, oh, wait, oh, my God, this is super interesting. I should write about senior citizens dancing in the park or, oh, my God, I should write about something else which might connect. So in the context of China, nearly everything was a story, but then not everything will end up as a story because some of it is just an Instagram story or just uh, put to be put away in your phone and never to be seen again. Um, there's a difference between, I guess, what a larger audience will be interested in and what you are interested in. So I guess that's where an editor or a person who you report to comes in to sort of help you uh, see, you know, what sort of makes it. Um, Tonight I was I was I was telling Mark before uh, just earlier I was uh, at a foreign correspondence uh, club sort of uh, hangout and someone was talking about the sort of revivalist sort of clubs when it comes to Taiwanese language speaking in Taiwan uh, a lot of people having mm -hmm. a chat about uh, you know you know getting on Facebook groups and so on and whoever was telling me this I was like oh my god that's a story can you put me in touch with mm -hmm. people why because we have similar uh, sort of uh, interest back in India, each state has its own language, each of us feel very rooted to linguistics and how we speak, so perhaps that's a story. Um, did I feel intimidated while doing my work uh, while in China? No, I think it's also because I kept with the soft stories and didn't go after the, as they say, the ones that are forbidden to write about. Um, I was, I think I was very clear that I had, my focus was on writing about people and writing and described it. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, so I think uh, it, I wasn't feeling intimidated in my time there. I also spent a very short time and wasn't able to do many of the stories I wanted to do. Um, how do I fact check so soft stories? Uh, I guess when you when you're talking about when you gave me the example of, um, you know, someone coming and telling you they passed an exam or not, that is pretty easy because it is uh, by the medical council. And I, I get to I'll ask them for their um, for their sort of certificate or whatever. So when there's a paper trail, it's great. But when you're writing about people, to an extent, I think I have intuition on whether someone is telling the truth. If you feel there's a gut feeling that the story is not adding up. Uh, you do go and uh, find other people who can vouch for um, what they're trying to say. So essentially, when you do a story anyway, you have to make sure you have a solid story. And often that is done by making sure you have enough people sort of uh, telling the same thing, right? Like being able to uh, uh, corroborate what the person is saying. With soft stories, it's harder, I would, I would imagine. 
but I also think like a story that I just mentioned of the grandparents, uh, it's a pretty easy story to do. It, it's two right. people on Instagram. I know how they looked. I go and have a chat with them and I write a story. Um, so, I mean, I guess working in a newsroom, uh, you do get the amazing experience of being pulled up for various reasons on if something doesn't add up, somebody will be like, hey, this doesn't make sense. Uh, when you're working independently, that's a bit harder. But when I do submit a piece, say to the South China Morning Post or anywhere else I've written, they do come back with their own fact checking sort of tools. So if you've missed out, someone else is catching it for you. And I have to say, I mean, I've been a journalist for about 11 years and I haven't had uh, I haven't had like a fact checking incident so far, which has gone wrong, thankfully. <laughs> Great. OK, well. Thank you again so much, Somia. It, uh, I can tell from the responses and the questions and, uh, and in, uh, uh, directing the audience to the, the chat box where uh, Grace, uh, the deputy director of ICI has kindly put in lots of your stories for people to, to look up and link to. Thank you. Um, and thank you again. And thanks to the audience. I will remind you, uh, and those of you who are still here, uh, that on March the 3rd, we will continue our public events program at ICI with a talk on new urban urbanisms of China and India, with uh, a book by a new book by Nick Smith and a new edited volume by Lisa Bjorkman on on Bombay. So that will conclude our our presentation today. Thank you again. Thank you and so much, Mark. Thanks a lot. Thanks everyone.